Well, thanks a lot for inviting me uh, to deliver this talk. And um, yes, as um, Yvonne was mentioning, I'm going to present um, the uh, recent uh, work I have been involved with in the last years. This includes my PhD, but also some uh, postdoctoral uh, research ideas. And um, yeah, my, the title of my talk is from Trinity to Fix Scale Models to Geohazard Applications. So in the first half, I'm going to introduce you uh, about these 3D data freak scale models and how we build those. And then I'm going to present how uh, I'm using those models for understanding and having more insights about geohazards. But before I continue, I would like to thank, um, how can I, like this? Yeah, thanks. I would like to thank many researchers involved in these uh, uh, results that I'm going to present. Uh, from the National University in Colombia, from the Geoffset Potsdam, uh, Freya University in Berlin, and also the Center for Mathematical Research here in Barcelona. And also, uh, I was funded by different agencies, including both German and Colombian institutions. Uh, the main idea of this talk is um, if we consider that there are many regions where we have very limited geophysical information. So all the tools I'm going to present are, um, let's say, focused on these areas where there are a lot of uh, open questions, but not many data. So the first thing I would like to, to answer is which new insights regarding both shallow and deep structure can 3D data integrative models provide? And the second question is, is it possible to have, a, let's say, better insights about potential geohazards? In this case, we're talking about earthquakes and marine hydrates <coughs> using these little scale models and particularly modeling a 3D thermal field. So I decided to work in the Caribbean region because, yeah, it's a area which is pretty large, but it also um, has a pretty limited geophysical information. And in this region, I built the gravity constrained to spheric scale models. Uh, so I will present the tectonic implication of this um, exercise, but also how these models uh, have been used to build a 3D steady state thermal field in order to evaluate the hypocentral temperature distribution of the earthquakes in the region and to predict some potential gas hydrate stability zones, helping us then to answer this uh, second question. But <clears throat> for those who might not be familiar with gravity, how can actually gravity help us to understand uh, the little free configuration? So we have uh, at least uh, two ways of doing this. If we, let's say, we assume this is a tall model in which this cube has a density contrast uh, of 1,600 kilograms per cubic meter uh, with the surrounding material. If we um, kind of uh, draw a profile along this tall model, what we can see is that the gravity anomalies will have this shape. Uh, it means that uh, they are positive in, in the entire region, right? But we have a second way of looking at the gravity field and it's uh, the vertical gravity gradients. The vertical gravity gradients are like, the second derivative of the instrument's potential. This is a little bit technical, but the good thing of this uh, field is that it has a negative uh, sign and you can see here outside the queue, but it has a positive sign over the queue. So we take advantage of this behavior, the negative outside, positive inside, to really uh, highlight horizontal density contrast uh, in places where we might have, um, say, a strong density contrast between the bodies. So the vertical gravity gradients, also known as set or VGG, 
uh, highlight this uh, contrast better than the gravity anomalies that you can see here because we can take advantage of this uh, behavior. And they are especially sensitive to shallow structures. So in my PhD thesis, I developed a new methodology in which we are inverting the vertical gravity gradients instead of uh, inverting the gravity anomalies in order to constrain uh, these uh, tectonic boundaries at crustal level. Uh, in order to work with this method, I am then uh, introducing you the Caribbean region because it's the place where I mainly develop these uh, techniques. And the reason why we are working there is because we have an anomalous uh, crust, and it's because we have the Caribbean Archimedes Plateau, um, which is forming the present day the Caribbean uh, lithospheric configuration. In the, this platform formed uh, something about 100 million years ago in the Galapagos hotspot, so in the Pacific. It migrated toward the north, northeast, until it reached the present uh, day uh, location. Uh, while it was migrating, um, let's say we nowadays can uh, see many aquatic terrains along the northwestern South American margin which are uh, pretty much like evidence of this uh, migration. In the, in the development, in the developing uh, of this uh, plateau, we recognize at least the fossils of magmatic activity. So this is uh, the cartoon showing the most commonly affected tectonic uh, model of the Caribbean plate. So we have in the early Cretaceous uh, the Caribbean cross, which has uh, had a thickness of about six kilometers. Then the first uh, basalts came, and the plume head um, interacted with the lithosphere, leaving uh, accreted or ultramatic cumulates underneath the previous uh, crust. Uh, yeah, leaving some basalt flows, and we also had extension. And then we had a second stage of more extension and uh, second stage battles that arrived to the lithosphere. And this is going to be important uh, because the um, commonly accepted tectonic model says that the plume head actually uh, was kind of allied with the thickest regions that we find nowadays in the Caribbean, which are about 20 kilometers thick. Uh, at the end, what we uh, have in the Caribbean are pretty uh, high density rocks and uh, pretty heterogeneous uh, due to this uh, tectonic history, right? So, in the first uh, part, I'm going to talk about the shallow structure. As I said before, uh, I'm working with the vertical gravity gradients. In this case, I did the uh, forward modeling using the sulfur pressurites. And you can see here in the map the model area um, on the, let's say, highlighted by this uh, black box. So you can already see that it's a pretty large uh, domain. And uh, the important thing here is that I'm starting uh, with a model that includes a lot of geophysical data at a global scale because the, the model is large. We're, we're modeling from the surface down to 100 meters there. And we have a, more or less a, an area that has a 4,200 kilometers in the x direction, x direction and 2,000 kilometers in the y direction. So I'm integrating sediment thickness, bacteria, mothelips, and tomography data from the s velocity model of Schiffer and because of the dimension of this study area, I'm working with spherical coordinates because I want to avoid the flat air approximation, which might not be correct for a large domain as the one I'm presenting here. So in this starting model, I am, uh, let's say, assuming a 3 density field for water, sediments, and mantle, following different approaches that we can read here at the bottom of the slide. And the idea of having this, let's say, more realistic uh, resolution for these layers is because they observe gravity, 
will be affected by the signal of water, of sediments, crystalline cores, and mantle. So if I am having a detail or solution for water, sediments, and mantle, I can assume that the residuals, which are the observed minus the model of gravity, will contain information about the crystalline cross, which at the beginning I assume at a constant density, right? So this is how the residual maps look like. You can see that uh, in this uh, black line, you see the, the polygons uh, of the tectonic boundary from case in the 1980s. Um, what we can see in these residuals, uh, yes, uh, there are some places where the change in the sign are highlighting uh, pretty sharply the transition between different tectonic environments. For example, here, the Cayman Throat uh, is really different from the North Nicaraguan rise, but there are other places where this is not true. For example, here in the Southern Caribbean, we see that the polygons uh, of case are not uh, really matching the the residuals that we are observing. So, in order to improve these tectonic boundaries across all levels, uh, I am in the same proposing these uh, new transitions based on the principles. Um, there are a lot of details in this map, but I just want to highlight a, a few of them. The first one is the continent uh, or the transition between the continental and oceanic domains here in the Southern Caribbean. The second is this uh, transition between the Colombian Basin and the Venezuelan Basin in the Beata Ridge area. And the third one are these high, uh, let's say, red bodies that you can see here in the uh, Lesser and Leeward Antilles, which are kind of uh, disturbing the, the, the volcanic car, uh, as you can see here uh, in, the, like, in a more regional scale, right? So these bodies, which are here uh, shown as red, are actually high, high density uh, material, which we infer are currently based like underneath the, the sedimentary basins or the sedimentary color in these uh, regions. I will show you a profile here so you can better understand what I am um, saying right now. In this profile, in the lowermost panel, you see like uh, the density distribution from the surface down to 200 kilometers depth. The red uh, regions are the mantle, while these uh, other are supposed to be orange, but <laughs> I think here you see lots of red domains, but this orange <laughs> corresponds to the crystalline cross. So in the middle panel, you see a zoom from the surface down to 20 kilometers depth, uh, so this is the crystalline cross. In yellow, we have the sediments, and in blue, we have the water. And what we see in the upper panel, uh, in blue are the model vertical gravity gradients, and in red are the observed vertical gravity gradients. So we see that with, with a constant density for the crystalline cross, we are not matching the observed gravity. After we do the forward inversion of this, we meet high density material here in order to fit the observation. This high density material, as you can see here in the upper, uh, let's say, line of the middle panel, are not uh, corresponding to any topographic feature. So these bodies are buried under the sedimentary cover, as you can see here, uh, but they are required in order to match this observability. Uh, so the same that the profile I'm showing here is this one we said before. So all these red um, bodies along the leeward and the fields actually correspond to high density uh, bodies at this regional scale. And actually here in the Curacao island, we do have the uh, high density rocks which are exposed and actually are interpreted as a relief of this migration of the Caribbean coming from the Pacific the present day location. So after doing the forward inversion, this is the final density map for the coastal configuration. So as I said before, these uh, high density bodies are, uh, let's say, required to, to fit the observations. 
so this was for the shallow part. Now, if we move to the deep structure, I'm showing here uh, the results of inverting the most commonly used gravity anomaly. So, we already worked with the vertical gravity gradients. Now, I'm working with the gravity anomalies. For this, I use the ICMAS Plus software. And I'm working now with an area which is a little bit smaller than the one I showed before. Uh, here, what is important uh, for you to have in mind is that within these uh, dash of white polygons, we do have a pretty thin cross. Uh, this is, I'm talking about even less than one kilometer thickness. And they are basically underneath the Colombian and the Venezuelan basin. So this is going to be important for what I'm going to present in a minute. So here, as I'm working with a, a gravity variable that is more sensitive to the deeper structure, I need to have into account a the much density because it has an important contribution to the model field. So here I'm showing the homographic data uh, at 75 kilometers depth, and in this other figure at 150 kilometers depth. And what we can observe is that we have two pretty different behaviors, right? At 75 kilometers, we do have higher uh, velocities underneath the frequency, which is not present any longer at higher depths. When we convert these velocities into mantle densities following a whose and lessen approaches, what we observe is that actually these high density, uh, high uh, velocities correspond with higher densities. Um, so yes, we do have this signal and the differential behavior between the shallow and the deeper part of the mantle. Um, so after inverting, removing the signal of water, cross, and the 3D mantle um, underneath 50, kilo, uh, 50 kilometer depth, these are the initial residuals I'm getting. And as you can see here, we are having these two uh, very uh, large misfits between the observation and the model. And if you remember, this uh, two regions actually correspond to the places where we have this ultra thin uh, cross in the Caribbean Sea. So, in order to compensate the observed gravity, I need to add more, uh, let's say, mass uh, in these places. So, after dialing, I will show you in a minute how they look like after dialing this mass, I am having these new residuals which are. Uh, better, uh, we are fitting the gravity better than the initial residuals that you show. So, how do these bodies look like? I am uh, showing you here uh, that at 75 kilometers, based on the S wave tomographic data, we do have higher velocities underneath the Colombian and the Venezuelan basins, and this is also true at 50 and also at 25 kilometer depth. So, in order to compensate gravity, I do need to have these high density bodies uh, underneath the Colombian and the Venezuelan base, right? And if you remember the tectonic uh, history of the Caribbean, we do have two poses of the planet activity. So our interpretation is that these two high density bodies, which are um, underneath the present day Caribbean Sea, might be telling us a story about the fossil long conduits. Uh, which uh, help to migrate this high density material from the mantle to. And just as a side note, uh, in our paper, we also had a G plate reconstruction of these bodies uh, for those who might be interested in, in, in such reconstructions. Okay. So, yeah, when we then look at the tectonic model of the Caribbean, if you remember, the previous model say that this, uh, the thickest part of the cross actually corresponds to a plume head. Well, what we uh, found here is something different. And this, therefore, we define a new tectonic model of the So, in the particular here in the air we have the Paragon cross, which then 
was affected by the coming month of June. And actually, uh, there was rapid uplift and also uh, erosion of this uh, center of the of the cross, uh, together with basal flows and underplated automatic cumulates. Then, at the second stage, uh, we might have more basal uh, coming in, additional extension, but then also additional subsidence. And what we see today in the Caribbean ecosphere, especially in the Venezuelan basin, are that these high density uh, bodies are actually aligned with the thinnest regions of the of the coast. So this is how we interpret these observations. Okay, so a uh, short summary here. What we have seen so far is that yes, even in areas we need the physical information, we can have new insights regarding the infrastructure structure using gravity. So for so the shallow and deep uh, domains. This working in, in the Caribbean and the Western South America. So regarding the shallow parts, uh, Defining a new methodology, working with vertical gravity gradients, uh, using, for example, the continent ocean transition. I am also working with uh, gravity anomalies in order to constrain the deeper structure, here, including NASCA and Caribbean Lab, as a way to demographic data. We uh, were able to find what we interpret as fossil uh, conducts of the Caribbean Arctic Plateau. And then this allows us to define an investment model. <laughs> then I'm going to present how this workflow is actually also useful to understand a bit more geohazards in this uh, region. And this research has been done in collaboration with Alvaro, who is here. Um, yeah, the preprint is available uh, in this link. If you're curious about it, you can have a look at that. Uh, basically, here we're looking again at the uh, study area, but in this time, I'm adding more things. What you can see here in this map is that the uh, spatial um, distribution of these events are quite different from, for example, the laser and fields. Uh, so in this margin, we do have to subducting slabs, they are flat slabs. So we have from the north the Caribbean subducting underneath South America, and from the east we have Nazca or Coiba slab subducting underneath South America. So in this region, we do have the interaction of these two practices, creating this a bit, uh, let's say, different pattern of seismicity. Uh, different in the sense that it's not like uh, the normal variety that you have some that you expect for subduction zones. But what is important here is that if you look at the earthquake depth, many of these events are actually shallow events. So we also have here a lot of faults uh, which are, let's say, um, also responsible for these uh, earthquakes. So the, the upper plate, um, we also have this type of events associated to faults. So the idea here is that I use this gravity constraint with phase configuration as I just showed you before, and especially the uppermost 25 kilometers to run a 3D steady state normal model. Using this model, uh, then I'm going to present what can we learn from this model. Um, in order to, to account for both the upper and lower thermal boundaries, I'm showing you here the map, the upper boundary conditions. So we are uh, using data uh, with observations on land from the verified land data set. At the bottom of the ocean, we're using data from the global data set. And then the lower boundary condition is the temperature of 25 kilometer depth that I am converting from the airway velocity into temperatures, okay? Um, so again, here, what we observe is that these uh, higher velocities are also associated with lower velocities. And here, we might be able to see a little bit of the slab signal uh, underneath South America. <clears throat> so our results, in this case, I'm showing the model hypocentral temperatures. 
Uh, only for cluster events. So this is really important because of this uh, part of the work, we are only focusing on the coastal uh, seismicity. And what we see here is that the majority of the events are having model temperatures of less than 350 uh, degrees Celsius. <clears throat> if I have time, I can discuss a little bit of profile that I, I've drawn here. But for now, uh, let's just focus on the hypocentral temperature. So yeah, although we have uh, many events, most of the events occurring at less than 350 degrees Celsius, we can also see that there are some places where earthquakes are occurring at temperatures higher than 600 degrees Celsius. I will talk a little bit about this later. So, um, one of the contributions from this research is that we wanted to upscale the laboratory experiments and frictional behavior of rocks. So in this map and this figure, sorry, what you can see are like the dots are the earthquakes and the associated uh, magnitudes according to this um, scale here. Um, the color-coded uh, regions uh, correspond to the uh, window of granites, granite and gabbro, gabbros and olivines according to laboratory experiments. So what we can see here is that actually many of these earthquakes um, actually plot in the seismogenic window of these observations. However, there are a few of them which are not completely uh, occurring at coastal, uh, at most commonly like coastal material, right? Because we have here olivines. So I'm also plotting here the hypocentral depths uh, with the D10 and the D90. Uh, the D10 corresponds to the deep at which the underneath this depth, much 90% of the earthquakes are occurring, and the D90 uh, represents the depth at which, like above this depth, 90% of the events occur. So this D10 and D90 actually uh, might be interpreted as a conservative estimate of the homogenic zone in a region. And what you can see here in the panel D is the seismic moment release associated to these earthquakes. And yes, this peak is pretty much, uh, yeah, the, the colors here are not really uh, good, but these two uh, earthquakes are the largest in the region, are magnitude 6.8 and magnitude 7.3. And these two earthquakes are responsible of this peak. And as you can see here, they are occurring at the base, very close to the base of the homogenic zone that we are calculating. And actually, these events occur in 1992, correspond to the Morin dust sequence that um, had very strong um, effects, including a complete uh, destruction of the Morin dust town. And we also had this rupture of the surface, liquefaction, and many other. Uh, secondary effects of this uh, sequence. So what we are learning from this uh, experiment is that yet yeah, this sequence actually the largest events occur at the base of the thermogenic zone. They are responsible of the highest uh, energy release in this uh, in the holes to the area. And um, yet we do have some places here, where a few events which. Uh, Temperature seems to be occurring at more, uh, let's say, not mainly crustal um, uh, rocks. So we are interpreting this in our manuscript as probably uh, that they are occurring in these automatic uh, terrains that were accreted from the migration of the Caribbean Acidic Plateau to this margin. And yes, we also uh, evaluated the upper and lower stability transitions, D10 and D90, in a more regional scale. And I will not enter in many details, but what we can see is that there are some faults. For example, here the Ramita fault, which actually acts as a pretty sharp boundary between different regions with different uh, seismogenic depths. Uh, the same is true for the Oka and Ton and Con. Uh, fault, this fault in the north, which is bounding also like D10 um, depths, deeper depths in the north compared to the south. And when we look at the D90 map, 
So we see here there is a, a suture sound called the Atupodistina. And actually, uh, this region where we have the deepest D90 uh, uh, results correspond to places where we have the thickest lower crust. And this is going to be important here now that I'm showing the temperatures, the corresponding temperatures according to our model. We are extracting the temperatures at this depth from our uh, thermal model that I'm uh, talking about. And um, what is important to consider here is that we are having the highest temperatures underneath the deepest basins in our region, but also uh, where we have the thickest lower crust, which means that uh, if earthquakes are occurring there, it's because the mafic rocks uh, have a beautiful different transition at higher temperature, so they are able to host uh, deeper events. And this coming to the final part of my talk, uh, the final um, experiment I'm actually running at the moment. This is not like a final result, it's an ongoing work. And it's about the uh, analysis of marine hydrates using the 3D thermal model. And in this case, uh, what I'm doing now is to uh, take into account the IPCC global warming scenarios to explore how hydrates might behave in the future. And the reason why this is important is because that hydrates are highly sensitive to temperature and pressure conditions. So what you can see here in this plot are in the Y, the pressure, and the X, the temperature, and the stability conditions for two different uh, gas compositions, the thermogenic source, which is a mix of different uh, gases, and the biogenic source, which is 100% methane. And towards the right, you see the unstable conditions, and towards the left, the stable conditions. So we see that both temperature and pressure play a key role in the stability of these uh, hydrates. So just to give you an example, this is the bottom water temperature, the projection from the IPCC in the Caribbean. So we can already see that for the optimistic scenario, I say this because it's the a scenario in which we do stop the anthropogenic influence in the um, global warming. And nevertheless, we observe this uh, tendency to increase the bottom water temperature in the Caribbean. And this is how the pessimistic scenario looks like. So this is the scenario in which we do nothing about the global warming. So we do observe a more, let's say, sharp increase in the temperatures at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, so the, again here, what we have very limited uh, the physical information about where these hydrates are nowadays present, we only have this uh, places here uh, close to the Colombian margin. Nevertheless, with our model, we can infer potential stability zones uh, depicted by these white polygons. Uh, this is a static approach. However, when I include the IPCC uh, projection as an upper boundary condition, so you can imagine we are changing in time both the pressure and the temperature at the bottom of the ocean. What we see here are places where these hybrids uh, might get out of the snow zones. So the, the preliminary results we are getting uh, are telling us that even under the optimistic scenario, because this is the optimistic one, uh, the stability of the hybrids might change in the Caribbean. So the final take home message of this story, I hope I have shown you and convinced you that we can have better insights uh, about the free configuration in any regions where we have limited geophysical information uh, when we work with data integrative models. Uh, so I show you the tectonic implication of doing this in the Caribbean and how using this tectonic uh, setting we can actually build a uh, geologically consistent 3D thermal model that help us to uh, have some insights about uh, hypocentral temperatures of earthquakes and how they how do they plot uh, trying to upscale the frictional uh, behavior of laboratory experiments and the ongoing work is using this to predict the potential um, hybrid stability zones 
uh, considering the IPCC global warming scenarios, then helping us to have some further insight about your concepts. Uh, before we leave, I wanted to take a couple of slides to show you what I'm going to do now uh, at the institute. Uh, yes, I don't know when exactly I'm going to start uh, my work here, but uh, I'm going to work with you all and her group. And the project is called 3D Equate. And the idea is that we would like to use 3D security models as a basis to understand the spatial distribution of earthquakes. So now I'm moving from a region with very limited physical information to probably one of the most well known, or yeah, with, with more data at least, uh, regions in the world, which is Southern California. So here in Southern California, we have the boundary within the North American and the Pacific plate, which define a strike eclipse system and the San Andreas Fault uh, system here. Uh, we do have uh, many other faults in this region, but yes, I'm going to be um, working in this uh, area. And the idea is that, of course, we do have a lot of technicity associated uh, not only to these faults, but also to the general tectonic uh, and configuration. So our goal is to quantify in a realistic way how a regional atmosphere actually influencing the off-fold stresses. Um, so what I, what I want to say here with off-fold stresses is that we first will have a um, uh, more detailed reconstruction of the lithosphere without taking into account the fault, because we would like to know how this lithosphere motivates the background seismicity. Um, this is a collaboration with Professor Carson Becker in at the University of Texas, and the general workflow is yes, yeah, so we have uh, as input data, the wealth of uh, the physical information we do have there. Uh, then our goal is to build a very constrained atmospheric configuration that will help us to have uh, better insights for geological uh, characterization, including a thermal model and also a biological model that they will help us to constrain the internal loads of the of the lithosphere. And in the future, uh, the idea is to also integrate the mantle in this storage, like the vast fractions due to the mantle uh, components. And yes, the validation data, uh, we also have a lot of observations in this region. And with that, thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to take any questions.